Howdy folks, welcome to Found Flicks. On this Ending Explained, we'll be taking a look at The Turning, where a young governess is hired to take care of a pair of siblings, and she soon comes to fear there's something dark and evil lurking in their home. Or is she merely losing her mind? Well, here we are with another January horror movie that really missed the mark, and was bestowed the honor of our second F cinema score for the month after The Grudge. But hey, at least this got an F plus. Way to go, nice work everyone. But unlike The Grudge that was entirely bad, for the turning it's really the ending to blame, or lack thereof, that really seem to burn audiences. Something so egregious that it completely undoes any goodwill the movie established up until those final minutes. It really doesn't even feel like an ending at all, and is almost like an insult to the audience because of how much of a hack job it is. Honestly feeling like they ran out of footage and just slapped some crap together and were like, eh, who cares, let's wrap this bitch up. Although the ending is definitely a disaster, in my opinion, a lot of the movie was actually quite well done. Director Fiona Sigmund, known for a number of classic 90s music videos, brings a great gothic style and feel to the movie. And our main trio of actors, led by Mackenzie Davis, give their all and do turn in solid performances. They really try their best, at points imbuing some actual life into their characters, but are let down by the ambling script that really has trouble ever getting going just kind of aimlessly going from plot point to plot point with no real purpose or direction. There's not much in the way of scares either, and a lot of times we see the ghosts and our governess doesn't, so they're just kind of standing there in the background like, hey, I'm a ghost or whatever, notice me please, and she just walks off without incident. It's like, uh, was that supposed to be scary? I'm more confused than anything. You'd think for a so-called more modern adaptation of the story, they'd maybe amp up the scares a little bit, but they really don't add or change much of the same basic story beats we've come to expect, which sort of makes the whole thing feel unnecessary, because this is a story that has been adapted many, many times over literally a hundred years. Now, if you're not aware, this is based on the classic Henry James novella, The Turn of the Screw from all the way back in 1898 and it's had its fair share of other big screen adaptations. By far the absolute best of the bunch is 1961's The Innocents, which was based on a play based on the original book. Kind of confusing, but this version is by far the most faithful and simply well executed of the adaptations. So if you want to see the turning story done right and a classic gothic horror, then absolutely check out The Innocents. Sure, I know it's old and in black and white and everything, but I promise it's really good. Don't be scared of old movies, folks, because they couldn't rely on cheap gimmicks back then and had to actually write good scripts. What a concept. Guillermo del Toro even credited The Innocents as being his main inspiration for Crimson Peak. Come on, that's some influential shit. Which brings up something else odd about The Turning. I've consistently heard that this was a passion project for producer Steven Spielberg. And I'm like, what? You wanted to make a third-rate retread of a story that's already been done over and over? And I just know Spielberg has seen The Innocents. He has to have. So it makes you wonder if that was so good, what was the point of making a new version anyway? It seems like he needs a hobby or something. <laughs> it's basically like impossible to improve on The Innocents and whatever the turning is definitely ain't an improvement. What The Innocents also does to perfection is landing the ending. Throughout the tale, we are constantly questioning whether the estate is truly haunted or if everything experienced is due to the governess's perceived mental breakdown. And the original ending keeps this ambiguous by design. That is the entire point. We don't truly know one way or the other. It's up to the audience to decide. And apparently the ending and true meaning of it has been hotly debated by scholars ever since the novella was originally published. The kind of ending that gets people debating and talking about what it all means. The ending of the new turning does try to keep this same ambiguity, but completely fails in execution. Although I do think I have figured out what the heck they were trying to go for. And I was able to uncover an original ending for the turning that was shown in test screenings, which does make a bit more sense than what we got, although it's still not that much better. So let's dig into the turning, looking at what I think it was going for in the end, as well as comparing its ending to the unreleased original one and the actual ending of The Turn of the Screw. Opening on a dark and gloomy night at the remote Bly Manor in Maine, our current governess or nanny, Miss Jessel, is attempting a frantic escape from the grounds. Forced to pull over to open the main gates, a man appears in the night grabbing her, our groundskeeper, Mr. Quint. The two are in a relationship of sorts, a one-sided 
misguided one in a sense, and things have become frightening enough for Jessel to want to flee. Now we don't know for sure what happened, yet it's heavily implied that Quint killed her for trying to leave. Naturally, this means the children will need a new nanny, and grade school teacher Kate is randomly extended the offer. Other than most certainly making more cash with the new job, and only having to deal with two brats instead of a class full, we aren't given a real solid reason as to why she would even take the job offer, or even how it was that she found out about it in the first place. Before moving to the estate, she visits her mother Darla at a psychiatric facility, finding her painting away as usual in an empty pool. Kate tries to convince her to go back to her room, but her mom seems quite mentally troubled, really only focused on her art, which as we come to learn could be kind of prophetic in a way, even if it does appear entirely abstract. And the question then becomes, if Kate's mom has been consumed by mental illness, is it hereditary and Kate is doomed to suffer the same fate as her mother? At first, Kate's new position ain't so bad, the only company being housekeeper Miss Grouse and young Flora, who is cold and distant to Kate's attempts at friendships initially, but begins to slowly open up to her new nanny, despite seeming to still have deep feelings for the prior Miss Jessel. They are able to develop a bond over time despite her initial squeamishness, and things are relatively uneventful at first. That is, until the return of Miles from boarding school, which Kate learns he was kicked out of due to violent and aggressive behavior, but keeps this info to herself. Miles is certainly a tougher nut to crack than his sister, coming across as boorish, and even a bit imbued with some of that classic toxic masculinity. He is a teenage boy after all, but there does seem to be a deeper layer to explain his behavior. Just as Flora was close with Miss Jessel, Miles was close with the groundskeeper Quint, who has also mysteriously disappeared, and it seems that Miles learns some of his behavior from his old friend. Or perhaps there's another supernatural reason for the children's odd behavior, as Kate begins to have increasingly intense supernatural encounters with what seems to be the spirits of Jessel and Quint. And it seems that these spirits have attached themselves to the children, essentially possessing them. And this is the real reason for what is going on here. This seems at least to be the case for Miles, whose behavior only gets worse over time. And at points, we do see the ghoulish face of Quint morphed over the boys, certainly implying his possession. And based on some violent behavior scenes sprouting up, it starts becoming a potential that he, in fact, killed Quint for dispatching Miss Jessel, showing us this violence has been within him from the beginning, possession or not. While Jessel doesn't affect Flora in the same way, almost trying to warn or inform Kate of something, they pretty much just fart around for a while, occasionally seeing the ghosts, and as Kate gets closer with the kids, she becomes determined that she must protect them from this perceived evil, which comes to a head when Miss Gross informs Kate that a package has arrived from her mother, containing some more of her weird art, this time blackened pages with some blank spots or holes that really don't look like anything at all. Nice, nice going, Mom. Yet upon Kate staring at them, she suddenly has multiple visions of the ghost, including Quint assaulting Miss Jessel, which she seems to have been trying to get Kate to figure out the whole time. Upon this horrifying revelation, she springs into action, feeling she has no choice but to whisk the kids away from the estate, and hopefully put a stop to their connected ghost harassing them. She rounds them up and does manage to escape the grounds, and it appears that things are gonna be all right, until we pull out, and the scene dissolves to become part of one of Kate's mom's scribbles, and we rewind back to about 15 minutes of the runtime earlier, back to Kate with the drawings. Uh-oh, fake out! Miss Grouse reminds her that madness is hereditary, implying that Kate has lost her marbles thanks to this whole experience. She's at least hopeful to be proven correct about her spiritual problem, and tries to confront the kids, and admit that they too can see the ghost. But rather than support her, they turn on her, sending her into an emotional spiral, weeping on the floor in a ball at the bottom of the stairs. Thanks kids, I thought we were friends! But their cold behavior also implies that perhaps the entirety of their relationship was indeed completely fabricated in Kate's broken mind, which our final scene seems to confirm. She then wakes up in an ornate bed down in the empty pool at her mom's psychiatric facility, who is facing away, scribbling as usual. She asks Kate if she saw her paintings, and turns around. When seeing her face, which we don't see, Kate screams bloody murder, and roll credits. It's more than enough to make you go, wait a minute, that was no ending, I've been swindled. It seems that it is designed to make you think, but it really feels like it's missing at least one important shot. We don't actually see her mom's face, it just cuts to Kate's reaction. But literally the only thing that makes sense is that it was actually Kate 
seeing her own face on her mother's instead of her mom's. The whole thing then implying that indeed, Kate has lost her mind, and perhaps even the mother figure was another of her own personalities, or that she and her mother were one and the same. And she was in fact the troubled prophetic artist chilling in that empty pool. Pretty much everything was then filtered through this distorted reality, and who knows what's real or not. Just that Kate is definitely nuts. But with that crucial shot missing, it simply makes no sense in its current state as any kind of ending. So that's why it's not too surprising to learn that this wasn't the original ending when shown to test audiences months ago. The other ending is certainly more coherent than the theatrical ending, but still not exactly wonderful. Rather than the 15 minute rewind thing, Kate still tries to escape with the kids. Yet this time, the ghost possessing Miles, Quint, has a showdown with the duo, and they appear able to defeat him and free Miles from his supernatural clutches. Yet no such luck, it turns out. As they drive off into the night, we see that Miles is still possessed by Quint. Kate gasps, and the movie ends. So this is kind of a much more expected or cliche ending to be sure, but it at least feels a heck of a lot more conclusive than what we got. And this ending almost seems to lean more into the side of the ghost being real rather than simply hallucinations. I can't see why they would want to do something more ambiguous in the spirit of the novella, but ultimately what they slapped together was too abrupt to make any sense of. Now let's compare that to the ending of the original story, which the innocents followed pretty closely. It's also worth noting that Miles isn't as much of a dick slash perv in this version, and his relationship with the governess is much different. And at this point, it's actually only Miles at the estate. As things grew more out of hand with the kids, Miss Giddens, our governess here, sent Flora off for her own safety. Attempting to discuss the ghost with Miles, she learns here the real reason that he was expelled from school, frightening the other boys with violent language and behavior. And he starts spouting off again, beginning to laugh insanely, seeing the spirit of Quint appearing in the window and joining him and cackling as well. The boy runs off into the night, Miss Giddens following after, begging for him to say Quint's name. But when he finally does shout Quint's name, he is there for sure. Miles then suddenly grows still and falls to the ground. Miss Giddens bends down and caresses the boy tenderly, assuring him that he is now free from the spirit's control. Yet this freedom came at a gravely cost, her realizing that Miles has died. Sobbing, she gives him a kiss, things ending on this very brutal, yet also very ambiguous note. There's a million questions, like just how did the boy die? Yet we do see that something actually did happen for certain. He's definitely dead. So was this due to the ghost, or was somehow Miss Giddens actually responsible for his death? We'll never know, and that's why the debate about the classic and haunting ending will no doubt continue eternally. So with that, we have reached the conclusion of this ending explained for the turning. Even if it wasn't all bad, the botched ending pretty much ruined everything, and ultimately pales in the long shadow of the innocence. And we actually have another adaptation of Turn of the Screw on the horizon, with the next season of The Haunting of Hill House, now The Haunting of Bly Manor, which will be yet another adaptation of the novella, which is interesting too because the book the first season of the show is based on, The Haunting, shares many similar story concepts and themes. But I do at least have faith with the upcoming Haunting of Bly Manor that Mike Flanagan will at least cook up something different and still honor the original. It's getting pretty dang good at that, especially after last year's Doctor Sleep. So maybe that one will at least be worth watching. This one certainly was not. Oh well. <laughs> What did you guys think of the turning and its dumbass ending? Which ending do you prefer? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.